I can see you now. Yes, I can see you and I can hear you. Maybe you. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm very happy to speak to you. Okay. That's correct. Yeah. Well, I think there's two basic reasons. Um, we, most of us know that the U.S. economy has been going through a hard time and jobs have been lost. The, the country is getting more and more unequal. The people at the lower end of the economic ladder are hurting. Uh, this has been fueled by um, an intense new uh, movement on the right, on the right wing. Uh, in the United States politics, that, that instituted by the Tea Party initially, but has been taken up more broadly now by Donald Trump. And that's trying to harness the discontent at grassroots level, especially amongst white working class people who feel that they've lost their chance at the American dream. So many people in this country now feel that the country is going in the wrong way, that you've got this uh, extreme partisanship, extreme uh, polarization in politics in the United States, and people like Trump and the Tea Party are capitalizing on that. The wall itself is only one manifestation. It's only a kind of a ping point. It's a catalyst for people's attention. Um, and it's an easy catalyst. You can point at a wall and you have something to blame. So in this particular case, the blame is allocated toward the, um, the immigrants. Immigrants become the easy target. They have no voice, generally speaking, and we can blame them for taking our jobs. We can blame them for using our services, our hospitals, our schools, etc., etc. And to be frank, there's more than a tinge of racism in this uh, kind of a response as well. So taking all together, I mean, you've got a, a rather toxic brew of economic hardship, partisanship in politics, and the search for a, a scapegoat for the situation that we find ourselves in. And people like Donald Trump have very effectively seized that a pretext uh, and focused attention on the war, amongst a number of other things, in order to stir discontent in the country. So, the war is very much a symbol at this stage. Um, when, when you hear Donald Trump asking for or demanding a wall be built, he's forgetting to tell everybody in Mexico that the wall already is built. He's forgetting to tell everybody in the United States that we already have a wall in place. There are 670 miles of wall now on the land boundary, not so much, of course, on the river boundary because you can't build fences in the middle of the river. Um, but the, the, the reports from everybody in this country is that the extent of wall building that can go on in this country has already been reached. The 670 to 700 miles that have already been built are the limits to all practical purposes, for all practical purposes um, in terms of what, wall, what we can build for walls. The rest of the terrain is too precipitous, it's too, it's too difficult to build on, and then of course there are bodies of water which you can't build a fence over. So we've, we've already built a wall out, in effect, over much of the border. It's not completely sealed, but as I pointed out, in practical terms, you could never practically seal it. Yes, I, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about what it would take to build a wall on the land so that the article that you referred to included quite a bit of engineering calculations about how many billions of dollars it was going to, do, it was going to take to build that wall on the land. It's just simply not going to happen. The water boundary, the river boundary, is another story altogether, and it's totally impractical to wall that off. Indeed, much of the river is now uh, covered by sound motion and sensing 
rather than by any kind of wall. We did try, some people tried to build a wall along some sections of the larger meanders in the Rio Bravo. And so they, in, if there's a neck arrangement as the, as the meanders work their way toward the Gulf, they built walls across the top of the neck. So everything that was in the meander area south of the wall, people were asking me there, Are we, do we live in Mexico now? Has, has the boundary moved? Um, the walls were also slicing through golf courses. They sliced through university campuses. They took people's land, much to their chagrin. Um, and basically, the, any attempt to wall the, the or fence off the river area is not going to work. If you tried it and you followed all the meanders, the wall would have to be three to five times longer than it would be if you simply built it as a straight line. Well, of course, anything is possible if you're prepared to spend the money. Um, but, I mean, we're talking now in, in the hundreds of billions of dollars by the time we finish building this thing, and we pay for maintenance as well. I have a simple, simpler response, Victor, to your question. Why don't you spend the money on something else? If you effectively want to seal the border, we have enough experiments going on in this highly technologically savvy country uh, in terms of biometric protections at the border. And indeed, California is putting quite a few of these experiments into play right now. In other words, if you can get effective electronic surveillance at the border, that will reduce the need for, in fact, eliminate the need for a wall. And it's going to be cheaper. Why would you build a wall under those circumstances? Yes. To get the attention of people like you, <laughs> and, and even in Spanish it sounds quite good. Um, you can put that in yourself. Uh, but, but the thing is, after over a decade of research on wars, and in particular in the US-Mexico border, um, I'm convinced that wars don't work. The, the Great Wall of China worked for a while, but now it's a tourist attraction. The Berlin Wall worked for a while, but now it's gone. And we, and we, tend to admire our wars as historic objects, but wars always come down. That's a simple fact of human life. Now, in the particular Mexico-US situation, there are large numbers of reasons why the wars are not going to last. One, people always find their way around, under, through, or above walls. People are very ingenious if they want to cross. Um, secondly, understand that the wall is a historical aberration. The connection across the border has been going on since Mesoamerican times, since prehistoric times. We've always had connection across the border. What you're seeing right now, what we've done in this country in the last 10 to 15 years, is the historical inaccuracy, is, is the wrong thing. Now, having said that, um, we must understand that both nations realize that the importance of trade between the countries, which goes through the border, which therefore can't be sealed. We spend a lot of time building walls and fences, but at the same time, we are expanding the capacity of our ports of entry and building new ports of entry to accelerate passage through the walls that we are building for our, by ourselves right now. Um, there are other infrastructural reasons. There are other security reasons. The International Boundary and Water Commission, Comisión uh, Internacional de Límite y Aguas, SILA in Espanol, um, they have just concluded a very important treaty, uh, amendment of a treaty, uh, to share water resources on the Colorado River, which I think is completed in 2014. The modern resources and, and um, uh, borderline activities that we share cannot be closed down. In fact, I think that our, both our security in the nations, in both nations, depend on having an effective flourishing border. And in addition, in this country, the last thing why wars won't work is because there's so much opposition to them. In this country, there's, there, are, there are almost like weekly demonstrations against the expansion of the wall. Um, one of the most important pieces of the uh, Obama and Bush administration's secure communities work, the secure communities program, has recently been canceled because it wasn't effective. It wasn't doing its job. 
and it was the, and that was cancelled because of a lot of public pressure about what was going on. So for all those reasons, historical inaccuracy, trade, security, goodwill between the two nations, um, the opposition toward the wall, um, they, the wall is not going to work. The wall is going to come down, and I think it should come down. Yes. Yes, we do. But and let me just repeat: I mean, the the wall is not hermetically sealed. You cannot, you cannot successfully seal that border. Period. Um, the number of people crossing is now in around 200,000 a year that's crossing without papers, apprehended by the Border Patrol. That's the lowest number since 1971. The border is effectively under control. In the United States, the big issue right now is interior enforcement rather than enforcement at the border. So, um, we, if you, if you, this is an interesting question for me and I'll try to be brief. But when I, when I started my work, I went back to 1848 when the border was created. Then I decided I really needed to go back to Mexican independence, then into Spanish colonial times, and then into Mesoamerican times. And that's over 2,000 years of history. And over that 2,000 years of history, there's been a constant flow across, across what is now the border, um, from Mesoamerica to Southwest Pueblo territories in the United States. The Spanish had an awful time trying to subdue the the northern border, and they utterly, they didn't really succeed. Um, this, there was so much going on. There's been such a long time in modern times since, that, by which I mean, since independence from Mexico. No, northern Mexicans have always looked north for their connection, and that I don't think is going to change. People who live in what I call the third nation on either side of the border have more in common with each other than they do with either nation. They tell me that. Their lives are intertwined, they speak a similar language, they've got a similar traditions and past, they've, they've defended their territories against common enemies. Those are reasons that I uh, allude to, to refer to this zone as a third nation. And I don't think that the, the, the wall building is going to stop that third nation. The only true question, Victor, is how much damage will be done before that wall comes down. I can't speak for all people, obviously, but all I spent over a decade in the Third Nation at the, and the border territories right now. And I think the people who live in the border region on both sides are simply waiting out the storm. And the more recent clouds that have gathered around Trump um, have been, by and large, understood as simple politicking and simply appealing to the basest instincts in people who are hurting. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's a, it's a, it's a, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a, it turns us away from what we actually should be concerned about. I don't think that people, by and large, are going to be persuaded by that rhetoric. There are obviously some people who will buy into it. Um, those people who are aggrieved and want to have a target, they'll always find some reason for objecting to the, uh, the efforts that are being made. But I don't think that there's very many people in this country, in the United States, I mean, who are taking these claims seriously. And I think, in fact, for better or worse, Trump is really seriously damaging uh, his election prospects by taking this, this stance. Thank you very much. And um, when do, when does it come on, Victor? By the way, where does Victor Hugo Michel come from? Yes, Victor Hugo comes from.
<laughs> I thought it was a great name anyway. But some of my, some of my Mexican friends might want to watch your program. Um, when, do you, when, do you, when does it come on? Okay. That would be perfect. Yes, I am. Good. Well, I remember, I remember good times in Mexico City as well. I've been to Mexico a lot. Mexico is in Nicaragua, no? Um, so uh, I'm really always looking for a good opportunity to be, to be in Mexico. And if I come to you, I'll see you. Thank you very much for your interest in my book and for, for a nice interview. I really appreciate it. Good luck. Thank you. Bye-bye.